even more exciting. And if you haven't had the chance to read Sticks and Stones yet, which is Larry's new book, it just came out about three weeks ago. Uh, it, was a, it, it was a great book. I, I told Larry just before we started that I liked it even better than I like marketing to the social web. So if you haven't had a chance to pick it up, it's on Amazon. And all, the best part about it is all the proceeds from the book actually go to the Home for Little Wanderers. The best part about buying the book, not only do you get some great content, but you actually can help out a, a great charity as well. So I uh, can't recommend it enough. That Larry's back again with us. Like I said, I read his last book. It was absolutely great. For those of you that don't Larry, Larry's kind of a guy that doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway. Um, Larry, he's, he's a globally known expert in public relations and marketing services. And as I mentioned earlier, he's the chairman of the Digital Influence Group. You may remember that he founded, uh, really, the, I think it was the first, if I'm right, Larry, um, interactive marketing agency, which was Thunderhouse, okay. um, working with a ton of different customers, everywhere from Coca-Cola to IBM, Siemens, Pfizer, um, all across the board. Uh, you also were you obviously formed the Weber Group, and that was eventually acquired by IPG, um, which you ran their advanced marketing services group, a uh, huge organization, uh, until, you know, uh, for a long time. And you currently serve on the a number of boards. <laughs> I won't get into each one. <laughs> Both nonprofit and academic institutions as well. And co-founder of the MyTech Hub, which is really popular here in Massachusetts, which is great. Like I said, your your last book, which I thought was was terrific, was uh, Marketing to the Social Web. And your most recent book is Sticks and Stones. So, Larry, welcome. I'm really psyched to have you back again. Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot, and it's great to be here. Um, uh, Awareness has been a great uh, partner, and also it's a great opportunity uh, to really advance the whole marketing platform and and the marketing community together. And I'm pleased to be here. So thanks for having me. Um, uh, Sticks and Stones. Uh, you know, you might say, why did I write this one? And um, I think as I was finishing um, Marketing to the Social Web, I realized that a lot of us were starting to focus so heavily on learning the new tools, the new communications tools and the new uh, analytic tools and the new measurement tools, et cetera, et cetera, that we were becoming a little too tool-involved. Uh, uh, and that, that, that isn't to mean that the tools aren't critical and new tools and advanced tools aren't critical and the, the marriage of marketing technology is forever together. But I also was thinking that people were starting to forget about why all these new tools and platforms are being created. And, and that is to advance either branding, uh, reputation, uh, influence. And in the old world uh, of traditional media, influence, reputation, and brand were sort of handled by different people in companies or uh, even, uh, you know, uh, in, in agencies. And what is really occurring right now, in my view, is sort of a convergence of influence, reputation, and branding that the best I can describe it is, is digital reputation right now. But, you know, branding to me has always been the dialogue you have with the customer. And so if we keep moving along this idea of customer-centric marketing and the concept of converging influence, um, you know, influence uh, brand and reputation, that's really at the core of Sticks and Stones. And I try to tell a lot of stories about uh, best practices and also some real sort of goof, um, <laughs> goof ups. Uh, your digital reputation in World 2.0, well, I try to cover uh, in the book uh, sort of basically three categories, big company, small company, and individuals. I start out the book with this guy, Chick Edwards, and the guy is totally blank, uh, you know, and if you, you look it up, he did everything wrong from being aliases to trying to hurt his competition. And I'm not going to go into deeply what he did, but he just kept making it worse. And, uh, you know, the issues of of not understanding that, uh, you know, the web is actually getting more transparent, not less transparent. In fact, the only thing, the only trouble I have with Twitter right now, which I think is a phenomenal tool and platform, is that you can have aliases. It bothers me. And I, it might sound like I'm an old guy, but I find the web is real power in connecting networks of common thinking and that let companies and others tap into those networks for the benefit of everybody involved. So I start out the book with sort of that whole individual reputation and how you have to be careful. I also am amazed uh, that in getting now in the middle of the third quarter 
of 2009, I'm going into Fortune 100 companies, and they'll say to me, uh, well, Larry, we're sort of dipping our toe into social media and sort of this digital reputation process, and, you know, we have our our page on Facebook, and we have our Twitter account, and I'm like, my God, these are companies that, you know, spend, you know, months on on, on complicated marketing strategies, spend hundreds of millions of dollars, and for one of the most critical, you know, platforms of marketing to come along, which I think, by the way, will be more powerful than television is so, as social media matures, uh, to just, you know, play with it sort of cavalierly or in, in, in a just a dip your toe way is really a mistake. And I'm starting finally, though, to see these companies say, you know what, I think this is right. And we're starting to see, you know, three, four, five million dollars at a time now sort of come from television advertising a lot. That's where it's coming from and moving into social media platforms. But to back to the reputation management process, I think it's really important to move into a strategic manner to identify the key stakeholders and the issues that matter to them. So really doing your mapping work is going to be critically important. We always did that as marketers before. Why not continue to do that now? Analyze your reputation among those stakeholders. You have to have be based in reality and know, are they making fun of you? Do they like your products? Do they not like your products? You know, uh, are these even places that you need to be? You know, set priorities and goals for their reputation management programs. Identify the opportunities for where you can connect and contact with the stakeholders. Uh, and implement creative approaches to promote the dialogue. What you're going to see more of in that number five is what exactly we're doing right now, which is we're creating microsites or subsites that are actually more social in nature. So they might be brought to you by a company, and um, but the branding process is moving away from what I call first-generation digital, which was very still intrusive in nature, like traditional media. It also is very uh, direct marketing in nature, so that you're clicking through things, things are popping up. That kind of transactional mentality is going to leave very quickly in the next 24 to 36 months to become uh, sites and destinations that are environments for the helping to promote dialogue with customers. And finally, obviously, we have to monitor and measure reputation. And, uh, you know, you tweak the tactics on the on the way that you go. You know, both um, – when I finished marketing the social web, I had come out into the kitchen, and um, I, I told my wife, she said, oh, you must be happy. It's done. And she said, but you look sad. And I said, I'm sad because marketing is going to get a lot harder before it gets better. And you know what? I'm a little happier now when I finish Sticks and Stones, just that I finally am finding marketers that understand it is harder, but you know what? We've come to terms that this is a verb thing, not a noun thing. It's a 24-7 type of business. It's relationships. It's just like having a marriage or a, a long-term relationship with someone or a brand. It's constant work, and it's constant fixing. If something doesn't work, get rid of it, all right? And you and, and the things that are working, use more of, all right? So, you know, obviously there's loads of tools. Most of you all know this, but I'm still surprised by, you know, very large companies and even individuals that are very popular in their marketplaces that don't have just basic Google alerts or, you know, aren't checking Technorati, uh, TweetScan, you know, all of these kinds of tools, and there's more than these, obviously. But, you know, you know, we need to be on top of how to measure, and, and none of these are BS. These are you know, sort of the first generation of what I call the snorkelers of the web, and the next generation is going to be deep sea divers, and um, and, and we're already seeing some of that appear, you know, from uh, Radiant 6 and Blog Pulse and uh, some of the other companies that are really working on uh, helping us measure, promote, and, and, and build a deeper and longer-lasting impact of social media for reputation. You know, Building a reputation, you got to start a dialogue. And uh, if you don't start a dialogue, there's nothing that a reputation represents. And uh, I liked originally how Zappos was using Twitter. I still like how they did it. And uh, I think that's one of the great places to start dialogues and to start blending and integrating the different tools we have, all right, to do this. So, uh, again, I liked it very much uh, that um, another site, 
like the site I like very much a social site uh, Nike is something to talk about uh, you know it, it goes from everything from you know a side comment most of these sites a lot of them that are popping up their search is really bad Nike's is terrific and to get into different coaches and running and any category you want and uh, sharing with different people um, I really liked what Nike was doing and again, that was, when we started out talking about this idea of blending, uh, branding, uh, influence, reputation as at the core of your marketing message, that's what you can see in sites like this one that I'm showing right now. Uh, of all the automotive ones, I've been really liking Audi, what they're doing as they're blending mobile, and web, which, by the way, will be completely blended at some point in the future, uh, whether it's Apple or somebody, we're going to be asynchronous finally, so that we aren't even going to say, is there a mobile application or is there, you know, or on the web, blah, blah, blah. It will be just a consistent digital environment, and I think Audi gets that very much and is uh, real-time about a lot of the, the stuff that they're building and working on and uh, like their site uh, uh, and where it's going in building the reputation. The key here is they believe the automobile should be a digital environment as well. There's no reason it shouldn't be a digital environment, and increasingly it will be. So um, you, everybody should take a look. This is one of the most important uh, slides, especially to the companies and agencies uh, that are listening. One of the uh, things that has been sort of keeping uh, companies, small companies, individuals from building proper reputations and brands online is that it's not organized uh, properly. And it doesn't have what I call the new roles of digital facilitators. And I offer, at least for some of the, uh, you know, some uh, uh, effort. Uh, to communicate clearly is some ideas of, of roles that I think should be uh, assigned, that there has to be somebody that's monitoring content. That's a huge job, uh, an e-community moderator, a responder, a social networking editor, a media distribu distributor so that you have it going around. I even think that I didn't even put on this slide that I had talked about in previous books and talks, uh, people like VPs of content or uh, – you know, directors of social media. I think those are a little too broad, even uh, though I brought them up early on a few years back. I think now it's time we get into far more uh, granular uh, assignments of responsibilities of, uh, of, of the way companies are being organized. The two biggest hurdles to building digital reputation and the use of social, more sophisticated social media programs have been um, – uh, budget, whose, whose budget is it going to come out of? And that increasingly seems to be the marketing budget, not the CorpCom budget. And secondly, uh, has been the organizational structure of a company that even with some of the companies we work with that have sophisticated social and social reputation uh, programs underway, they're still organized as they were in 1960 with sort of the head of advertising, the head of PR, the head of direct marketing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that really needs serious an analysis uh, to understand, you know, where that is headed and where that's going to go. The, the, the third thing, uh, hurdle that I would say is, is the increasing comment from CEOs that there's too much negativity in the social arena. And I argue that that's just first generation. People are going to gripe because they have a place they can gripe. But you're already seeing sites be self-policed. And, you know, if a gripe's addressed properly, uh, you know, then most users, most customers, and even the company usually can win out if they're transparent, thoughtful, answer questions right, and uh, continue to focus on the work they do and communicate it properly and, uh, and thoughtfully. Um, can a small business build a big digital reputation? It's happening all the time. I mean, my friends over at TripAdvisor who were really pioneers in this, I mean, you know, what a, you know, they have helped so many small companies build uh, big reputations. You know, the Inn at Union Square is an example on this one. Uh, I have uh, some examples on Yelp uh, if you wanted to go to 
some nice seafood restaurants, uh, you know. But, you know, increasingly, uh, if you had some kind of combination of a constant contact and, you know, this kind of reputation web placement and outreach, I think small businesses can build really big, big digital reputations. And, and I think, you know, it's going to continue to be that way. It's funny, I'd like to just take a side thing I'm thinking about right now. I, last year, my daughter, oldest child uh, is going away to college uh, this week, actually, so I'm a little emotional today. But, uh, but uh, when we did our looking for colleges, I said, let me go online and look, uh, uh, look at all this uh, for you, and I'll point, you know, the list we made together. I looked at 35 colleges, and you could have taken the logos off of them and switched them, and they would all have looked the same. The, uh, and and it, it just was just wrong how they were trying to build their reputation and differentiate themselves until one school had a blank screen and a young undergraduate came out, and it was Rich Media. She put down her backpack and said, this college changed my life. I'd like to take you on a virtual tour. Oh, my God. All right, and the blog post that that school is getting, et cetera, et cetera, fabulous. Also, as the dad, I was collecting all the collateral materials that all these colleges spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on, and I put them all over the dining room table, and you know what? My daughter didn't look at one. She was only looking at the results in the blog sphere and e-communities, and she knew more about those universities than reading any of the materials. So any company, individual, small business that thinks, you know, printing things is going to help their reputations, actually I think it's going to hurt your reputation now. So I would be very aggressive about, you know, starting to change your tactics and uh, and your strategies around building these. Big businesses, oh, my God. I can't wait for the day where there's very little television advertising Um at least to a, a whole generation, there's uh, uh, no television advertising except for, uh, you know, live events where it's, uh, even though I, you can, you know, hit the fast forward button. And I think what, where that money is going to go, television, by the way, will always be with this. People complain that I'm anti-television. I'm not. I love entertainment and I like sitting and watching something. So, you know, but what's broken is the marketing uh, business model around paying for that entertainment. So where I think a lot of that move, uh, money is going to go is going to go into digital reputation. It's going to go into digital content creation, and that's what branding is going to be in the future. I love what Stonyfield is doing, which is one of the fastest-growing companies in this country uh, with everything around, you know, uh, social messages like sustainability, uh, to wellness, to organic growing, to recipes, and starting to build networks of people that are interested in different things, introducing uh, digital couponing, which I am just totally fine with. Uh, people complain to me that, oh, Larry, how could be Mr. Social Guru and like digital couponing? Come on, why not? Everybody likes a bargain. And if I'm part of a community and I can, you know, have some digital coupons or some some great deals on other things, I think that's terrific. That's a benefit of being part of a community and working through that. So I think it's just terrific. And uh, other big businesses that I think are doing it right, I think IBM is doing a great job. I think General Electric's doing a good job. I think um, some company, some uh, new uh, pharma companies like Genzyme uh, are doing extremely well. I think even Coke is finally getting it together. I mean. I remember my daughter, uh, my middle daughter coming to me a couple of, about a year and a half ago and she said, Dad, the, the lamest thing just happened on, on Facebook. I said, what, Julia? And she said, Coke wants to be my friend. <laughs> and all her friends were making fun of them, but at least Coke has learned that now they have to step back and need a bigger strategy around, uh, their reputation online and what can be done about it. So, um, companies that are doing it, I think, are, are, are quite good. Um, YouTube and video rep, um, I have a chapter. If if you only read one chapter in the book, which I hope you won't, I hope you'll read the entire book, Sticks and Stones, but the if you only read one chapter, read the YouTube juggernaut. I was just out with Chad uh, Hurley out in, uh, at YouTube in uh, San Bruno. We had a nice chat. He and his senior people, I gave a talk, and uh, 
and he asked me why I wrote the YouTube juggernaut and, uh, chapter, and I said, because it's going to be at the epicenter of reputation in the future. And hopefully it'll be YouTube if it gets more organized and and there's more control over certain channels and widgets, or I guess they're called gadgets, uh, because they're developed by Google now. But what I, I see is the visualization of the web and Web 3.0 and how much that's going to impact reputation is just immense, all right? And I'm not talking about the viral video where the, uh, you know, the guy in California talking about his, uh, his uh, his affairs uh, with the mic on and he didn't know it. That's all fleeting stuff. I'm talking about serious, thoughtful, you know, building of reputation through visual uh, means, rich media means, and YouTube right now is at the core of that. I think Cisco's doing a great job of using YouTube. Uh, it even has great mobile YouTube applications it's worked on. And I can't over... Uh, state the importance of understanding the impact of video and that it all can't be silly. We've got to understand, sure, there's a role for humor and fun, but increasingly there's going to be, we're going to be living in a less text-based world, all right, and we're going to have to understand that we're going to need expertise in creating great, impactful video, and I'm not talking about having, you know, the, the quality of National Geographic or the BBC video. I'm just talking about basic, good video communications uh, and interactive video communications because we're still in a lot of these uh, places one way in our presentation of uh, of uh, video. And so I can't, again, can't overemphasize, love the chapter. And uh, Chad really, it's great to know that Chad really loved it too. Here's a guy who, whose idea I think is going to change the world, YouTube. Uh, and uh, and it was great that he liked it. And no, also, if, if you all don't know, I think YouTube, here's a prediction for all of you, YouTube will overtake Google as the most popular search engine within 36 months. And I don't know what they're going to do, if they're going to have to merge them or figure it out, but they own them, uh, they own YouTube now, so I guess it doesn't matter. But search by video and sound is going to just be the next huge, huge, and social search. So, it's going to be something that we all need to pay quite a bit of attention to in our creation of this stuff. Uh, negative comments, you know, you got to judge them. I think there's too many sites right now that are trying to comment every uh, to every negative comment. You really have to prioritize. Sometimes there's always a squeaky wheel. Let's make sure that we understand our serious, you know, the old story of Jeff Jarvis, you know, and how that really – Force Dell to use their mind. They have great minds at Dell, and they came up with ideas, Storm. Great idea, all right? And it put a more positive face on things, and it really helped them address some of the product issues they were having, product service issues they were having. And it really helped change, turn around the situation of the Dell reputation, which was taking a huge beating. And, uh, again, that's an old story, but the, it, it's so important that uh, especially big companies really keep track of the comments that are happening so they stay on top of it and really address them right away. I mean, I'll talk a little bit in some of the things we can learn from the Obama campaign, but I actually will very much like the use of walls so that you can really keep stating right away if something's false, if something's wrong, we're just on top of it right there. And, uh, and we, and we, we put it out there on the wall of truth and make sure that we understand that, you know, where that's going. So, um, always be aware of the negative and where you go. I have a whole chapter on the new craft of PR for those PR people out there. And, uh, everybody made fun of me, even though I built the largest PR firm in the world. Uh, you know, when I said three years ago there was absolutely no reason for a press release, and I got, took so much crap for that. And I got to tell you, guess what? The decline of the press release is amazing the past 12 months. More and more, nobody's sending up press releases. We're tweeting, all right, we're Facebooking, we're, you know, we're doing so many things other than putting out a press release. And even companies like Microsoft here on the issues, putting it right there, having search there, all right, really sub-micro-segmenting 
uh, their communications, and I think it's just changing the whole craft of, of public relations into the business of dialogue and the business of brand building. And I think it's going to be key that uh, that PR understand that the future is going to be around helping really move conversations into the correct directions of their clients' benefits and trying to influence opinion through content. That's what PR originally did. That's what it still can do, but it has much more effective tools and much more effective ways to get that across. Uh, again, I can go on for two hours about the, you know, the future of PR, but I will let you read the book about that. I think it's my, probably the last time I'm going to write about PR specifically because I think, uh, it's pretty much set in cement where that industry is going, uh, with the new tools and the impact of the way we're communicating now and having the biggest change in media in our lifetime. Uh, cause we will have no newspapers by 2015. Uh, there'll be no nightly news probably in 2016, 17. You'll probably still have news you can access at your point. Uh, I don't think there'll be any physical magazines. They'll probably all be on e-readers, most likely Sony readers since I think it's the better product. But the, uh, full disclosure, I represent them. But, uh, and, um, you know, I, uh, PR's got to adapt. So, Quickly, whole chapter on the lessons from the Obama campaign. So proud of our blue, blue state group here in Massachusetts that helped, uh, help really, uh, drive the, the digital and the social platform that, uh, myobama.com really, uh, really did. I mean, to watch my daughters be able to watch his speeches, you know, uh, from uh, their school in Massachusetts, wherever he was live that day. Uh, I mean, just basic smart use. Of, uh, of social uh, platform and, uh, and understanding that, you know, a $15 pledge was just as important as a $1,500 pledge, uh, especially if you got so many more of them by connecting with people all the time. And, uh, they integrated numbers of different applications, uh, from mobile to ringtones to different types of search from live event work to, uh, to issues, you know, you might not have been interested in certain issues and other people were interested in other issues. It was just uh, phenomenal the way they used it. And it's first generational, but it's changing everything. Uh, Obama gave his talk yesterday. You know, the average Capitol Hill uh, um, uh, assistant to the congressman and the senators is 29 years old, and they're just Twittering all the time. And so the, the way information is moving so fast and so quickly it's going to change the way we govern. So I would, all, if anyone's interested in this area, you really should start to look and Google for uh, the different ways governance is going to change through the uh, social web and reputation, digital reputation management, because I think you're going to see quite a bit coming out, and not just following what Obama did, but building on what Obama's people did. And... Uh, the future of digital reputation, I mean, really in Web, web 1.0, uh, corporate was more important, um, you know, and it was pretty one-way communication. Everybody just put their brochures and collateral material online. Web 2, all of a sudden the stakeholders were taken over. It was like, you know, they've taken over the farm. You know, all corporations are bad. Uh, User-generated is important. Well, Web 3.0 has already begun, and that's where I believe there's going to be an equal equilibrium or an equalization of corporate and stakeholders, where corporations are open, honest, direct, develop content that is relevant and important to their stakeholders, and the stakeholders are going to respect it so much that there will be an equality, a give and take, a 50-50 relationship of that corporate content and stakeholder content that I think will then balance the way reputations and brands and the power of their influence is monitored. A commercial for W2 Group, we're a holding company of next-gen marketing services, uh, fast-growing, but the more important thing about it is I don't like to sell marketing services. What W2 and its companies are trying to do is simply represent companies, communities, countries, or causes that can make a difference. 
If they can make a difference in their market or in their world, we want to work with them and help bring the latest marketing thinking and technology thinking to bear on uh, their success. Um, with that, this one's me. Huh? Yeah, that's you. Maybe I'll put that back. <laughs> no, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. All right. Go ahead. But before we get to the Q and A, I do want to let people know about some. Uh, and, and actually, the slide that you gave on the slide that we talked about Obama. Yeah. There's a lot of chatter on on Twitter about you know some of the questions around that. Um, you know, if you just uh, jump back ahead to those events things there. Yeah, uh, I'll go. Yeah, or you can. Yeah, okay. Are we there? There you go. Oh, there we yeah. are. There we are. Yeah. What's interesting is uh, the first webinar, the next one that's coming up on September 22nd, for anybody on the line, Joe Trippi, for those of you that don't know who he is, Joe he's actually, he he's was the, Howard. He, yeah, he was the advisor to, to Howard Dean, uh, the social media advisor for Howard Dean. So if you think back to the Dean campaign, Howard Dean, you know, whether or not you like him or, you know, you voted for him or anything, he, he actually took, he was the first politician, a mainstream politician, that took a very grassroots social media approach to how he uh, went about campaigning. And, you know, Joe's going to have a lot to talk about, you know, specifically about that. He also advised um, Obama as, you know, Barack decided to do his social media stuff. But really the interesting story starts with, with Howard Dean, who was, you know, the one that basically laid the groundwork for everything Obama did. And then, you know, every, you know who knows what's going to happen next, right? But uh, Joe was the mastermind behind that, so he's the next one coming up on September 22nd. If you're interested in registering for any of these, you can go to awarenessnetworks.com and check them out. Um, also, want to let people know if you're going to be in the Boston area, or if you are in the Boston area around October 6th, uh, it's part of the Inbound Marketing Summit. There's a big tweet up we're having with Gary Vaynerchuk who's going to be, uh, you know, with us for for the night. He's actually keynoting the uh, the the IMS down at uh, Gillette Stadium. We're going to be at CBS scene. Uh, it's a pretty big tweet up. We have about 100 people registered so far, so uh, it's getting close to the limit. We may be releasing some more tickets, but if you can, go to GaryVGillette.eventbrite.com, and we'd love to have you come down there. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, also, from from uh, from the floor of the Inbound Marketing Summit, this is going to be really cool. We're going to do Awareness Live, and basically what it is is a panel discussion. We're going to have Chris Brogan, CC Chapman, Paul Gillen, Jason Falls, and our very own Dave Carter. Um, <laughs> Live from the floor of IMS, asking them a ton of questions, and let you ask a bunch of questions as well while we're down there. And finally, on October 22nd, we have uh, the folks from Community Roundtable coming in. That's Jim Store and Rachel Happ. So we're we're really happy about that too. Uh, a lot of exciting events coming up from awareness. If you're interested in any of these, you can just visit our website. Um, so that's really the, the quick awareness pitch on the uh, on the upcoming stuff that we have going on. So a lot of stuff. We hope we can make any of these uh, if you're around. <clears throat> So now the Q&A part, the fun part, Larry. we got a, a ton of questions, just like we did last time, uh, and they're, they're actually still coming in. So I think Twitter's actually a little slow. We're getting uh, – there's a little delay, I know, on my end with some of the tweets that I put out there, so I think people are still putting stuff in. But one of the first questions that I wanted to jump to, and, and someone brought this up uh, as you were talking about the YouTube stuff, is, uh, you know, it's interesting. YouTube's being blocked by a lot of companies. And – because it's being blocked, does that make it a viable option, especially for B2B uh, organizations who are looking to put out videos? Yeah, uh, good, good question. Um, a lot of people are blocking it. There are, there's also a lot of companies. I was at a major bank who doesn't even let people go on Facebook during the day, you know. Uh, so I think that's all bizarre. I mean, don't we live in America? I think, the, you know, the only reason I think they would be blocking is for productivity reasons, uh, which I also think is stupid, what we don't trust our people. And, uh, you know, YouTube is still an entertainment platform, so maybe it's like watching television at work, uh, you know. But, you know, we, we didn't break televisions in case, you know, there was another 9-11. You know, people can go see and follow the news uh, out in the lobby or, or in the cafeteria or something like that. So I think that'll fade. I think that's a, just a reaction to first-generation uh, new media, uh, so that's one I think that'll fade. Two is I do think some more control will be coming to YouTube, uh, you know, especially with the the way the new widgets and gadgets are being, uh, you know, uh, used, and that so that there's a, there's a little more understanding of it as a a marketing vehicle or an information source. That and as long as companies don't misuse that and think it's just like TV commercials, then I think we'll quickly move to a, Again, like I was saying, more of an equilibrium of sort of user generated and corporate. And, uh, for anybody out there that has uh, companies that block it, just, you know, email, email me and I'll, uh, you know, start 
you know, tweeting about how, what a terrible practice that is. <laughs> I think we all will. I think you should just send out a tweet about it, whoever it is, and we'll all just start tweeting about it and say, you know, let let this person, let this company watch YouTube. It's unfair. Yeah. You know, anybody that, anybody that knows that a company that's blocking YouTube, let us know. Please. <laughs> tweet about it now. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, just a, a kind of a more tactical question someone asked, but do you know how, have any guess or any idea uh, about how much Obama spent on the tools and, and the team to help manage a social media campaign? Yeah, my guess would be, uh, you know, again, a lot of it was volunteer. Uh, there was a lot of the technology that was given or, you know, donated, uh, like, like happens in this. But I think somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 10, 12 million bucks. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like it would be something right around there. They did a lot. Yeah, I mean, you know, where, where the money starts to get, get going, as you know, is, is in more of the real, when you get down into those database marketing levels and the software needed and, you know, the accuracy of things and then the rich media applications, I think, and the production of those and uh, just a lot of the behind-the-scenes technical work, I think, was uh, was tough. I think most of the creative work was not that expensive. I think that was – and a lot of that was given. Uh, and I know Blue State Group worked fairly, you know, pretty – low for them, and, uh, and you know, a lot of people were, you know, taking it on themselves, too, so right. sort of took on a life of its own, so. Yeah, that was more of a movement, really. Yeah. I mean, as things went out. But I, and I think the short answer, too, is that he probably spent a lot of money, he probably could have saved a ton if he went with big and awareness, you know, yeah. just the whole thing for him, you know. Totally. Well, I think what will happen now is he's, you know, actually to your next guest, Joe, who I know, I mean, they sort of broke it, you know, the were the first ones that started to break the ice, and then Obama showed how it can really be hugely impactful. And I think what you're going to see now is a whole new level of sophistication that is using software companies like Awareness, using agencies like Digital Influence Group, that take it, take it again, to an, a level of sophistication that has better visuals, better organization, better uh, uh, reporting, uh, you know, better monitoring, Better, uh, you know, just access, uh, better creative, and and it's going to become a far more professional thing. Much like, as most people listening are probably much younger than I am, but you know, much like the the marketing machines of politics, you know, through the 50s, 60s, 70s with television, and 80s, you know, Ronald Reagan even went on, you know, an amazingly emotional ad morning in America. I think that's all going to shift to uh, web based and. Uh, and uh, digitally based environments that are going to be also more highly emotionally charged, and uh, but that's where the money is going to be flowing. You're absolutely right. Well, Debbie, Debbie actually has a, an interesting question because she says it seems like too many firms, that's including media firms, are just ignoring social media and refuse to participate. So how do you convince them before it's too late to kind of join in the join in the fun, join in the action of everything? Well, if she's talking about Debbie, if you're talking about uh, ad agencies or what I call first generation interactive agencies. Um, the most of them are starting to get it. The issue with the agencies, in my opinion, is most of the interactive agencies and ad agencies grew up in a one way or intrusion based marketing uh paradigm. So they were only used at buying media and moving messages out in one direction. And it was in the interactive area, it was very much based on direct marketing. You can trace most of the early interactive agencies to direct marketing people and database marketing people. So it's hard to change horses in midstream. I'm sorry to use cliches, but, you know, it's very hard to change from paid media to earned media, especially if you haven't studied and and, and learned about it and, and understand that this isn't just a category. One very famous uh, interactive agency, actually based out of Boston, uh, calls social media an alternative channel. Well, that to me sounds like gay marriage or something. I mean, you know, it's like, hello. It's not. It's, so it's more of a, a way of thinking. We, we've got to all make a leap, and companies are included in this too, that this isn't a channel. We're not talking about just another slice of the marketing pie. We're talking about two strategies real life and digital environments. And that's it. And but they're both very complex. And until that starts to be embraced, 
and, uh, and, and worked on. And then secondly, I would say, look, for 80 years, Madison Avenue and, and London advertising, uh, bigwigs were very, very good, and I compliment them on the measurement nomenclature for what they did in traditional paid media. So, CPMs, okay, et cetera, et cetera. We're not there yet. We're an inning one. I'm hoping the social media force starts to really get organized around maybe cost per engagement, CPEs. But we're going to have to get that level of sophistication to start getting massive movement from agencies and businesses to go there. Uh, so that's just a couple thoughts. Mm -hmm. Another question that came in that, that you know, yeah, I think it's a, we've got a lot of great ones. So I think this, this is a great one, too. Um, how would you suggest responding when a competitor copies your marketing and verbiage on a, on a program verbatim? <laughs> do you do it on the social web? Do you take it offline? Oh, man, I don't know. I guess it would have to be situation to, situation to situation. My, what I'm arguing, and this will sound like maybe too much uh, high priest here, but I'm arguing to brands that want to lead in this next generation that they actually monitor their competition but ignore them and focus just incessantly on the customer and communicating with that customer and bringing content to those customers in a digital environment where they want to come stay. I argue that the, the brands that, that – uh, here's what I say it in the last book, Not Sticks and Stones – I talked about the job of the marketer being to build comfortable, attractive digital environments. Much like you like a store, you should want to go and stay in a digital environment, learn, do things. I'm not promoting Amazon here, but one thing I liked about Amazon a few months ago is they sent me an email that said, uh, Mr. Weber, we know uh, you know that uh, we lost a great American writer earlier this year, John Updike, and we know you bought some of his works. We wanted to let you know we have some rare footage video footage that we're going to post at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, blah, blah, blah. I made a drink. I watched those videos. I liked them. I watched some other videos. I went and wrote some bad reviews of a couple of business books I didn't like. I wrote a review of one I liked. I looked at some that, of my reviews. I bought six books. I stayed on an hour and a half. Now, you might say, get a life, Larry. But, hey, I stayed within an environment, and what did I do? I was social in nature, and I also bought stuff. So that's what the marketer's job, and I don't care if it's business to business or what it is, because there's a slice of time for every thought leadership in every category. So that's an interesting question because we just got one um, from Kathy on Twitter. Uh, she asked, do you think there's a difference between everything going on here from a B2B perspective versus a B2C perspective? And I know it's a common question, but... Um, yeah, and it, it is. What you're going to see is the consumer jumped on it right away because there was just so much audience, right? And the consumer companies, especially because um, when they see numbers like 300 million people on Facebook, they go, oh, my God, you know, that's more than any TV show. Mm -hmm. So they got to figure out a way. You're going to see those companies go down more the route of sort of what I would call, you know, superficial – uh, but still important social uh, social sites, but a lot more moving to digital couponing, uh, loyalty programs, uh, you know, education programs around their products. Like if it's a food company, obviously around nutrition or organic or those kinds of things, and, and that'll go one way. What you're going to see in the corporate side or the business-to-business -business side is an increase in what I call gated communities or passworded communities that are going to start building very, very, you know, micro-segmented places where, if, example, if you're the chief information officer of a healthcare company, uh, you know, you might want to go to an IBM or an Oracle site where show your password and you get to meet other people. There's rich content that you can listen to while you're driving in your car, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be a, sort of a different type of approach to social and reputation management. And I also argue that we as consumers of this new type of media are going to micro-segment our time that way. So there will be time spent on a Facebook or a Twitter, but there's also going to be time spent on, you know, a, a marketing site if I'm a marketer or if I'm a, you know, if I buy and sell wood, I'm going to go to wood.com or, you know, 
kind of thing. So it's going to be less about I'm part of a social network. I even think those words might go away in the next few years. It's going to be here's my life, you know. I sort of want to go to the Red, the Red Sox once a day, but I only go to Amazon once every 10 days. And But I also have a job as a financial advisor. So I'm going to these two really cool financial advisor sites uh, that I spend time on. So that's how it's going to work, I believe. So. I agree. Yeah, I, I, so the only thing I disagree with is, is cool financial advisor sites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they're gone. I, I was actually asking some of the Ivy League schools or my – daughter was applying to. I said, where are you going to train all these kids to go? And there's no more investment banks. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly has an interesting question. She said, due to the anticipated shift in where people are looking for information, should we, and we being the marketers or you know everybody on the phone, should we be taking our print advertising dollars, what we spend on magazines, newspapers, that kind of stuff, and start putting it into the web? I think you should have been doing that years ago, but now I think it's a it's an absolute necessity. And if I use traditional media right now, like any magazines that are left, though, if you've been to the airport lately, I think Fortune Magazine was maybe a quarter of an inch thick this week. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, so what I would do is, if you do use traditional media, I think it's increasingly going to be used to get people to digital destinations. So watch the Super Bowl ads this uh, coming January or February, whenever the Super Bowl is. My guess is almost all of them are going to try to get you to a digital destination, even if it's a beer company uh, or a car company. And so that would be, if you have enough money in your budgets, I would use some form of traditional media to aggregate customers and potential customers to a, a digital or a social kind of site. So, especially talking about, you know, that destination. So, as you, as you know, companies start to drive, um, you know, in the Sony E-Rear thing that we did is a great example of it. I mean, as you start to drive people towards a digital destination, a community online, that, you know, definitely more and more organizations are starting to do. Uh, how important is moderation of these sites? Uh, I think moderation is important. I don't, I think over-moderation is bad. I think it's just like, you know, the best talk shows in history. You know, the moderator let people talk if they had something good to say. If they didn't, they broke in or they went to a commercial, I think. Yeah, right. I think yeah, so I think moderation does play an important role, and I think it's going to play an increasing important role. I disagree with some of my colleagues who think uh, user-generated is going to dominate in the future, and it should, like there's some kind of social morality about user-generated media, I think there's professionals in their industries, and they should be taken at a higher level. I should be have more respect for my views on marketing than I do for quilting, all right, for example. So, you know, and it's not that you have views. Yeah, right, right. But, you know, that's the kind of, uh, you know, dynamic that uh, is going to increasingly occur. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cheryl actually has a really interesting question. I think this is the one we'll wrap up with, but there are several several models for social media monitoring uh, on groups, so things like distributed, centralized, cross-functional models for, for you know, how you monitor everything that's going on in groups. And yeah. Is there one that you specifically recommend or, or think is better than the others? I, you know, I'd have to ask, you know, my guys about that. You know, you'd probably be a better person to, like, to an- answer that question. I know Awareness has some tools. Uh, you know, I know... Uh, I think Jive Software out in Oregon had a few tools. Radiant 6 is trying to develop some things. Uh, but you know what? Everything's got to get deeper and better. Uh, we're going to have to be really good at analytics. But I also don't want the overanalyzation of things. You know, the direct marketing industry did that in the 90s. They, you know, they tried to get not only your zip code, but what color car you had. You know what? There's a point of, you know, too much information you can't do anything with. So, I think that more understanding the the behavior in networks and what people respond to and the types of dialogue and, uh, you know, what keeps people engaged, what's downloaded most, that kind of stuff. What are the outcomes of the stuff we're doing, not just analytics for analytics sake? I was lucky enough at public to run, oversee uh, the largest at the time um, um, consumer market research from NFO, which is now part of Taylor Nelson Softwares, which is part of WPP now. But uh, you know what? These these product marketing people like at P&G and stuff would wait uh, two weeks to get these giant, almost encyclopedic uh, reports 
on, uh, you know, buying behavior of orange juice in Scottsdale and stuff like that. Well, that might have worked then, but it still is a big waste, I think, of, of a lot of time as now information moves so quickly that uh, we have to do quick analysis, thoughtful analysis, but really work on what's moving the dial. So, so one last question that just came in from Marketing Veep on Twitter. Uh, and I'll just read the way it's written. It says, do tell, which university won you over with its use of social engagement? Um, there were two, but my daughter's not going now. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's actually going to go uh, to, to, to uh, an Ivy League school up in New Hampshire. I won't give the name. But the uh, the two that, I, that won me over from some shows or stuff, there's a little school in Connecticut I was very impressed with. You should look at their site called Trinity College. Uh, I like their uh, use of social, and uh, I also liked what Stanford was doing very much. Yeah, no, I'm familiar with both. Actually, I used to, I, I was doing some consulting work with a company called College Week Live, and there's a shout out to those guys. They're based up the road in, uh, in Newton, and it worked both with, with uh, Trinity and Stanford, and they really had great uh, social outreach. Well, and, and also, it's a tough question. You're, you're right, Mike, but it's a tough question because if you just look at the paid for site of a university, that's not where most of the great stuff is happening, like I right. was alluding to during our time, is my daughter was finding more about blogs uh, that gave advice from kids that already had gotten into a school, how to get right. into the school, you know, so it was less driven by the, the universities, and some of the universities were embracing that and some of them weren't, so... Yep. Sort of an interesting time there. But. Yeah, no, it definitely is. Well, well Larry, it's, we're exactly at three, and I just want to say thanks again. It was it was great having you on. I think we got a ton of questions. I'm sorry, everybody out there, we didn't get to every single one of them, but um, I will go through and see how many questions I can dig out, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to you with some answers. But, but Larry, really appreciate your time. Uh, sure, and I love doing it and uh, love the movement we're all part of. And, you know, just tweet me, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll try to answer other questions too. So. Yeah, that's right. So if you're if you're looking for Larry on Twitter, it's it's right there. It's at the Larry Weber, um, you know, on Twitter. I'm, I'm Boston Mike on Twitter. Feel free to send anything over to me as well. And, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Have a great great afternoon or wherever everybody is. You too. Talk to you soon, Larry. Bye bye, Mike. Bye bye.